One of the most exciting tours that I saw was uh, was Lance and uh, Orridge. I had like a minute and a half gap, and uh, Lance was up by about a minute and a half, and they were starting the the hill climb, and somehow Orridge misses the turn and and falls just over the little edge, and to my surprise, Lance looks back and sees him fall, and Lance turns around and waits for him to get back on his bike. There never was a more disciplined cyclist when it came to training. There was never a more focused, more driven cyclist than, than Lance Armstrong. So what difference does doping make, depending on what it is? It is extremely minimal. San Jose State University happened to be about 10 miles away from the time one of the four velodrome cycling tracks in California. And I'm so competitive like Marcelo is, I was just angry that I got cut and I didn't make it. And I was gonna stay there and finish my college career. Without mentioning any names, we were both approached to enhance our, our abilities through, you know, drug use. And, uh, and I think it was just such an easy decision for both of us to go. Now it's not something that we're, we're gonna do. That's not the line we're gonna cross. A different kind of show today, folks. Normally, uh, the chief, Mark Garrett, and I are on here and we're talking about uh, murder, mayhem, crime and punishment, politics, foreign powers trying to take over the United States. Today, it's about uh, sport. It's about the U.S. national cycling team. Even the listeners who feel like they know the chief, they might be surprised to hear that he was actually a member of the U.S. national cycling team. I didn't know that until uh, recently. So we're going to hear his story today and uh, also the story of one of his good friends, Marcelo uh, Aru. Uh, Marcelo was a pretty well-known cyclist here in the U.S., member of the 2000 Olympic team, uh, the team that went to Sydney, Australia, teammates with Lance, Lance Armstrong. And for both of you guys, I guess my, my first question is, and I know, Marcelo, your dad was a pretty, uh, pretty well-known, I guess, international competitive cyclist uh, out of Chile. For you, yes. what, was, it, was it almost preordained that you were going to be in cycling? I mean, was it almost from the start as a child, you knew like, this is something I'm going to pursue? Well, you know what, uh, Bill? No, actually it wasn't. Um, you know, I, I started, my, my pops was very into sports. Uh -huh. um, so he was, he, he was one of the guys that said, Hey, look, I don't care what you do, but you're going to do some athletic sport. Um, Cause he thought it brought determination. It brought discipline. Um, so I actually started in soccer. Um, at uh, y uh, AYSO on Balboa, uh, Balboa Park in, in San Fernando Valley. Um, and I did that for a couple of years uh, and I enjoyed it. It, it was fun. Um, and one day I just, I, I got the itch to start writing. Um, so my dad's focus shift because for him, soccer was just a fun thing to do. Mm -hmm. But he was very serious about cycling. And so uh, when I told him, hey, you know, I, I want to start riding. I want to see how, uh, how I'll do in cycling. I mean, he laid down the law. and I was only 11 years old at the time. You know, he said, hey, listen, it's, it's expensive. It's, uh, it's, it's not a joke. If you're going to do this, you're going to commit to it. Um, and, and, you know, away we went. Now. The fact that I, I raced for so many years, we, I don't think either of us expected that. Right. So, um, you know, and, you know, the story goes on with, with uh, racing internationally and, um, you know, having him by my side made it uh, uh, much, much easier for me, I think. Yeah. You know. Now, Mark, I know from, from past discussions we've had and just knowing you, I know you... I don't want to say you grew up in Southeast LA, that wouldn't be accurate, but you did live there when you were a very young child. Um, yeah. I, I, listen, I certainly don't think of that, especially when you hear Marcelo describe this sport as an expensive sport to get into. I don't think of South LA as being a hotbed for cycling talent. Um, 
how was it that you came to find cycling and wh what kind of drew you to it and how did you get started in it? You know, interestingly, Bill, like so many other things with Marcelo and me, our, our stories uh, have a have a similar path, although totally separate as individuals. But, you know, I grew up with an older brother who at one time it signed and cut, signed and cut, signed and cut by about three NFL teams. He was an All-American um, uh, safety uh, when he was in college playing football. And uh, I still love football. Um, and at the time, I wanted to follow my, my brother's footsteps. Long story short, um, I walked on at San Jose State University, and I was the last player cut Ooh. at the end of the spring game. And I was devastated because I thought I was going to play for Jack Elway, who was the coach at the time, who was John Elway's father, right. and who my brother had played for at Cal State Northridge. And it, it turns out that before that, about a year before that, uh, some of my friends who actually race bicycles, they say, hey, Mark, you got to get a, a lightweight bicycle and just go on training rides with so you can stay in shape in the wintertime for football practice. So I'm like, nah, nah, it's like with bicycles, you know, it's for losers, whatever, whatever. But they finally talked me into getting a bicycle. And I would go out in these, you know, 30, 40, 50 mile rides, kill myself. But one thing they were all talking about, was, man, you're really quick. You have a lot of, you can really sprint, really, you know, when we sprint for like city limit signs, things like this, have them find you, you're killing us all. You gotta try doldrum racing. And I didn't wanna do anything competitively cycling. I was gonna be a football player. I was gonna fall off my, after my brother. Mm -hmm. When I got cut, Bill, in San Jose, San Jose State University happened to be about 10 miles away from the time one of the four velodrome cycling tracks in California. And I'm so competitive like Marcelo is, I was just angry that I got cut. I didn't make it. And I was going to stay there to finish my college career, academic career. So I bought like the cheapest track cycling bike that I could find. And I went out at 19 years old, which is pretty late in life to start mm -hmm. um, a competitive cycling career, bought a bike. And I start winning all these training sessions at, um, on the velodrome. And uh, my passion was more competition than it was cycling. And it was a venue uh, for me to express that competitiveness. And uh, through that, Marcelo and I met on a much higher competitive level a few years later. Yeah. So, so Marcelo, explain to people, because I think, hey, for me, and not being that familiar with competitive cycling, right? When I think of cycling, I think of road racing. Of course, Tour de right. France, uh, Tour de California, races like that. Give our listeners right. um, a, a bit of an explanation of, of the velodrome and how one finds or chooses one over the other, or are you, or do people actually compete in both, or they have a specialty, or what's what was the competitive circuit for both of you actually like coming up, and and, and how did you find your home in velodrome racing? Well, I was drawn to the track now, to my. To my pop's uh, disappointment, he wanted me to be a road rider, uh, but I just hated the road. I, I I thought the road was just a boring event. You know, you race from one point to the other. Um, it wasn't, you know, and I still think track cycling is really a spectator event because the, the spectators, they're involved from beginning to end on the track. They see the entire race. Um, it's exciting. Um, the sprint event and uh which is called the king event because it's just like the the uh the the 100 in, in track and field mm -hmm. you know it's it's that exciting it's a quick event but it, it's the most exciting event on, in track and field well that's the same in track cycling the the sprinters are are the kings of the track um so for me it was it was really an argument with my pops because i, I I just love the sprint event. I, I, I was drawn to it. Um, I love to watch them race. I, I didn't law, I like, really like the long uh, endurance event, even though my dad always said I was, I was better at it than, than, than sprinting. Um, so um, I had to convince him that that's where my heart was, was the track and, and the sprint events. Um, so that's, that's what we went with. But if it was up to him, I would have been a road racer. Interesting. And, and, and Mark, different training then for road racing versus track events? I would think that the way I'm hearing it described, the track events, it's more uh, explosive power, um, 
if you know if you're comparing it to the hundred yard sprint, very different than let's say marathon running or or something like that, right? Yeah, you know, Marcelo brought up it's you know it's comparable to the hundred meter sprint and yeah. track and field. It's exactly right. Both a marathon and and a hundred meter you know, track and field event. They're they're both running technically, but they couldn't be more different in their approaches to training uh, and the physical attributes that are required. So the same thing is true with with the match sprints, with um, uh, the the short power events in cycling. Um, now, one thing, and, and uh, I'll let Marcel talk about this, you know, as we kind of progress, but we spent, <laughs> we spent way more time uh, on the road with the road riders, you know, in, in, in the early part of the season or really before the competitive part of the year, building, you know, base miles, getting that base fitness in. Uh -huh. But later on, as the year progresses, you're getting closer and closer to your events. You have to specialize your training. That requires, requires, you know, tons of weightlifting, tons of uh, uh, power intervals, uh, strength intervals, really things that literally, literally make you vomit if you're doing them to the level that you're supposed to do in preparation. So, um, yeah, a, a totally, totally different uh, undertakings, though, the the endurance events and the short power events and guys uh the the actual setup of the track it's quarter mile track or what is the, the velodrome track or so well um so the the track you when mark and i were racing you had uh i think you had um three levels mm -hmm. so you had a, a 250 meter track um, which is what they race on now specifically. Um, then you had a 333 meter track. Um, and the difference is if, if you saw the 84 Olympics in, uh, in LA, that was a 333 meter track. Um, and they even went up to 500 meters, but, um, and, and I say 500 meters all that, that's one lap around the track. Um, but now, uh, the rule is it's it's 250 meter track and it has to be indoor. Oh. So the United States only has one indoor track, which is in Carson, California here. Um, that is the only indoor track in the nation, wow. uh, which is, it's crazy, but it is now in Europe, almost every track is indoor. Um, so it, when you see international racing here, uh, it's always going to be here in LA because it's the only indoor track that we have. And part of the UCI rules, uh, which is the governing body for international cycling, um, one of the specific uh, uh, things that they want is it has to be indoor because it takes away from the element of the of the weather. You know, because if it rains, you can't ride the track unless you're racing in Japan. Uh, you know, uh, for, for money, uh, then they ride, uh, rain or shine, but, uh, but yeah, indoor track, it's 250 meters for one lap and it, it has to be indoors. And, and guys, although it's, um, uh, I don't know, I, I guess I think cycling to me has always been unique and maybe track cycling is a little different in this respect than, than road racing, but I think of it as, a hybrid where it's an individual sport, but also very much a team sport, right? So, and again, that may be different on the track, but racing on the track as part of a team, are there, are there different strategies or team orders, or is it only uh, like two team members going at a time, you know, or, or, or what does an actual heat look like? Well, there, there are so many different events on, on the track. Um, now, internationally, they've reduced the number of events from when Marcelo and I were racing, but there still are a number of events. And depending on the event, it's either a, it's a true individual sport or it's a team sport. So an example of a team sport, there's one called, actually it's called a team sprint, or I'm sorry, what they call it the Olympic sprint now, Marcelo, or still a team sprint? Um, Olympic sprint, yeah. Olympic sprint or team sprint, but Olympic sprint. And that actually involves three riders and they're actually riding together over a three lap period to see how fast they can, you know, what time they can turn over three laps against another team on the other side of the track. Um, 
they run at the same time, you know, starting halfway respectively from each other. Uh, same thing with the uh, pursuit. Um, it's four riders, same, this similar, um, similar goals, you know, how fast the, the team can cover a certain distance, um, uh, as simple as that. So those are true team sports with, um, and there were a couple other ones, but what Marcelo and I, Marcelo and I did were individual. It was you against the other person on the track. Now, generally without getting too deep into it, mm -hmm. And things have changed quite a bit. They've changed quite a bit in configuration and rules uh, since Marcelo and I raced. And Marcelo raced later than I did. Um, but things have, have changed. But generally speaking, it's you against the other person on the track. And they, they will start out in heats with the match sprint, which is what Marcelo and I did, among other things, but primarily for purposes of, of this conversation, did the match sprints. And they are they are heats similar to track and field where you'll have you'll have a hundred meter heat things like that really similar to that, and it's a, it's elimination rounds, and how that starts is uh, you have to qualify for the match sprint competition. You qualify by going out and turning a two hundred meter time okay. by yourself. It's just like qualifying in, in car racing. You go out and run the fastest time you can over a two hundred meter period, and then what happens is they pit the fastest person against the slowest person in the earliest heat. And what that does is it generally brings the fastest people together at the top of the competition when you get your quarter and semi finals and finals. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how it works. And then you get into elimination rounds. When you get into quarterfinals and above, it's best two out of three. So it's not a single elimination, it's a double elimination. So quarterfinals and above, you have to win two of three possible heats against your opponent. And to get you to the uh, to the uh, gold and silver round, and and how did you guys end up actually meeting each other just through the, the competition scene? You you find yourself matched up against each other a bunch, or, or how did that happen? Marcel, you want to take I see Marcel's <laughs> laughing already, so you go ahead. Well, let's just say that there's a certain uh, best friend of mine who didn't want me to be part of his team. Um. So we we raced at the Encino Velodrome. So we knew each other. Got it. Um, eventually, uh, Mark and I, well, we actually became great friends in Indianapolis when we went, uh, I think it was 1985. I had fallen and broken my collarbone. And then Mark was all scraped up too from a race from same um, same uh, uh, event, but uh, he was he was in the senior ranks and I was in the junior ranks. Um, and uh, by the way, we, uh, you can see we were very accomplished. He had a broken collarbone and I had a road rash on my head down <laughs> to my ankle. So we know what we're doing. But Mark and I, uh, Mark and I, I think we talked in the lobby until like three in the morning. And and it, 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 you know it just it was a friendship from that that day on. Wow. You know, it became my best friend. And that there's a. Uh, Anywhere we went together, we roomed together. Right. And I, he would, and I'll tell you this, uh, because I, we're both very competitive, but I would room with no one else that I was racing against except for him. Huh. Uh, we understood that he was my best friend, but if I met him in a round, I was going to treat him like anyone else right. and vice versa. Um, so it, it was, uh, you know, that's how we met. And I'll tell you what, um, cycling brought me so much joy. But, uh, you know, um, my best friend, I mean, that's what's, you know, I look back at cycling. I go, thank God that my dad opened this door to the sport because I would have never met Mark, right. you know, and, and we've been best friends ever since. And um, um, it was just, uh, you know, I was all, uh, you know, for both of us, I think we always hope never to meet each other in the heats. Right. It if was always a joy meet, to meet each other in the finals, right? Where it's worth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, and can, we did. I there was a, a lot of times sure. that yeah. we met in the finals. Um, uh, it was great racing. And, but we, we never let up on each other. And, uh, you know, there was times where I could, I could tell you in at, here in Los Angeles at the Olympic velodrome, um, uh, from, uh, 84, him and I were racing and he may not remember this, but I, you know, I, I had him dead to rights. Uh, we're going into uh, turn three because 
well, we, we number the turns, you know, one, two, and then three, four, and then the finish line. We're going into turn three, and I thought he was above me. So I was looking to my right. Somehow he came under me and he lifted my front wheel. He came under me and put his shoulder right up under my armpit, lifted my right wheel. And I mean, I went up track and he ended up winning that race. You know, I had to check my shorts after the race, but, um, but that, that was, that was, that's how we competed. I mean, Mark, you know, it was, uh, it, it was, uh, it was. I mean, we, we did everything we can to beat each other. Right. Um, I mean, we didn't want each other to fall, but yeah. if it happened, I would blame them because I would have done the same thing. Right. So, so <laughs> tell me, uh, oh, true. listen, the, the one story I found about you guys racing together was, uh, 1988 in Houston and it was a yeah. tandem event and, uh, T tell me that story. There was some kind of crash. It was really kind of, there wasn't a lot of detail in the story, oh, but, but it looked like a tire yeah. blew out or something. And, and explain tandem racing. What, what is tandem racing? Yeah, some kind of crash is the right phrase if it was some kind of crash. But tandem racing is just what it sounds like. It's a bicycle built for two, as the song goes. And um, Who steered? There's a driver. Yeah, who, who was the What's driver? That? I was the driver. Okay. That's right. And... Um, and Marcelo was the molester. I mean, the stoker. Right. He sat behind me. <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a hairy event. It's a hairy event, even for you know people like us that had spent. Uh, look, the, the event can be dangerous. Whether it's tandem or single, it's a dangerous event. You're riding on on you know wooden tracks or concrete tracks, at 40 miles an hour, and if you can imagine going down like on a motorcycle just with a piece of lycra, you know, mm. as your protection, and of course the helmet. That's it. And that's what it's like. But yeah, we um, we were racing in Houston, 1988. It was a it was a uh, a dual event. It was um, U.S. national championships. It was also qualifying for world championships. So it was a dual event. And um, the team that we were racing, the other two guys, it was uh, Tom Brinker and Bart Bell. Um, we had beaten them. It was 17 days earlier. We had crushed them in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center at another. Grand Prix. We'd beaten them two in a row very easily. And uh, so we were very confident. We weren't cocky because we know anything could happen in racing, but we were very confident based on our performance from a couple of weeks earlier. And we have them in Marcelo was it semifinals? Um, Semi or finals. We were against Bart Bell? Yeah, in, in Houston. That was, was uh, or finals. We had fallen the semis. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Um, we crashed yeah. in the semis against another team. That's correct. Yeah. We crashed in, a sem in the semis against another team, not the one I saluted to. And what happened was our uh, our front tire. Now, again, these are two big guys mm -hmm. on a tandem bicycle going about 40 plus miles an hour on a banked track. Mm -hmm. And and these things happen sometimes. The pressures, the forces are so great, but our front tire, the tires were actually glued on to the rims on, on these bicycles. Our front tire actually rolled off the rim at full speed. And you can imagine just, it just comes right, the entire bike right up from underneath you. And so at 40 miles an hour, all that mass, Marcel and I just went sliding our left sides, uh, really, really vicious crash. Fortunately, we didn't break anything, but it was almost as bad because we we were just so torn up, literally, basically second degree burns all over the left sides of our bodies, and so. But the competition side, the competitive side, was uh, was dominating with both of us, and I think a lot of people would just say it's enough for us. But we got right back up. We put on skin suits. I remember this specifically. Marcelo actually had left his um, his additional skin suits back in the hotel room. And I had a backup skin suit, the same, you know, the correct team stuff. Marcel didn't have one. He actually had to borrow some clothing from another team just to put on so we could get back up in the race. We got back up, bruised, bleeding. We purposely didn't put any bandages on. We didn't want any constrictions, anything restricting our movement at that point. And we got back up and uh, we won the next two rides wow. against the same team that we just crashed it. We came back and beat them two in a row. Ooh. That's right. That's right. And 
we, but we knew what was coming because we both crashed before as we indicated in Indianapolis and we knew how, um, how devastating that kind of severe road rash can be. So the finals for that night, and they were going to be, I don't know, five, six hours later, seven hours later. And we, we understood what might happen and, and what we thought happened would happen. The swelling set in and, and probably a mild infection at that point. And by the time we got back to the track that night, we were, we were just balloons. We were so blown up with, with the swelling, the bruising, things like this. We came back and we just didn't have the physical capacity to ride as fast as we, we had against this team earlier. And so the same team that we had beaten easily about two weeks earlier, we lost to wow. in the final round. I, I know for me, it was one of the most devastating, um, it was the most devastating things that happened to me athletically because Marcelo and I had our eyes in the world championships um, a couple weeks later. Right. And we knew that we were going. And that was in my career, that was my, not Marcelo's. Marcelo had other opportunities and took great advantage of them. But that was my one clear shot at reaching a world championship event. And that crash cost that for me so, and I'm glad that Marcel will have the opportunity to move did forward you, because of that crash did you not qualify or, or was it just a points thing where you didn't qualify I mean yeah the winner of the the winner of national the national champion was going to go to world championship and, and correct me if I'm wrong um world championships kind of equivalent to there, there is no tandem in the Olympic at that time in in the Olympic games am I correct in that you know what I can't there there used to be and I cannot remember remember Marcelo knows the bit um Ironically, the very first event that I watched in cycling that I actually watched was the Olympic tandem. Um, as a matter of fact, our coach at the time, Andre Beck, he um, he won the bronze medal in the 1972 tan uh, wow. Olympics on the, the tandem event. That's right. They since have have taken the event out. I'm not sure what year that happened. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. I don't think there was. Uh... Olympic, I don't think it had an, we had an Olympic event in tandem. I think that had taken it out before. The, the world championship was the big, yeah, big event. Yeah, kind of like the reading I did was like that was, the world championships was the big international event for tandem. And yeah, you, it yeah. sounds like you guys were, were pretty damn close right there. Yeah. So, yeah, we so sure as were. a competitive cyclist, and, and this is in the 80s, um, what are you, are, are you guys... Like Mark, I'm guessing you were a college student or just out of college at that time. Like, what, yeah, I graduated from college in '86. So, and, are you um, able to? How do you how do you mix training with making a living and supporting yourself? You know, you, you know, and you you live at home with your parents. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so, so is that really you know to be a competitive? And I know times are a little different now, but to be a competitive cyclist at that time, it was a hundred percent in like you don't work a full-time job and then train at night or, or, or what's that look like? What, what is training and living look like at that time in the eighties? Well, and I'm going to let Marcelo jump in really quick, but just so you know, this, this is one place where at this point, Marcelo and I did have divergent uh, lives as far as how we approached cycling and what opportunities were, were um, open to us. But at the time, um, I was waiting to, I had a college degree. I was waiting tables, you know, full time in order to, to, you know, support my, my habit of, um, being on the U S national team and traveling and national championships and grand prix and things like that. It was very flexible. All my bosses at restaurants were very good to let me, you know, leave for two weeks or three weeks and come back and work full time. And the schedule was very flexible. Marcelo had a different, um, had a different experience and, uh, I'll let him talk about that. Yeah, you know, for for me it was it was uh you know again uh, thanks to my pops because he was very very supportive of the sport. Um, you know he um, he lived the stuff that he couldn't do in the sport through me, and so he was he was a hundred percent in. Mm -hmm. You know, and so uh, I had a uh, a bit of uh, an advantage to the point where I, I you know I couldn't get out of in nineteen. 86 um i think i was a, a junior in high school or something i couldn't get out of high school quick enough hmm. to just focus on the sport you know for me high school was just in the way of of uh of cycling because i was at that point 
you know, in 86, I had won, uh, I was, I won four national titles. You know, I, I, I was, um, on the junior national team, um, uh, and hoping to be on the senior national team, you know, and thank God in 88, uh, Mark and I made the U S national team. And we were in, uh, we were in Carlsbad, uh, San Diego, uh, for training camp. You know, it's very different than today. They don't have training camps today. But I thought, you know, training with these guys, God, I mean, I was a young, you know, 18, 19 year old training with uh, Nelson Vales, who was, uh, you know, Olympic silver medalist, uh, Scott Berryman. Um, I think Ken Carpenter was there. Uh, Bobby Livingston, which Bobby Livingston was just, uh, he was an animal on, on one event called the Kilometer event which was it's a it's basically you against the clock for three laps if you're on a 250 meter track it's four laps but he was just a, a beast um so i got to train with these guys uh, but um you know for me it was very different uh, I, I i had a lot of support from my pops and um uh you know uh but you know going to the going to training camp was i'll tell you what if it wasn't for mark i don't know if i would have made it through training camp to be honest, uh, Andre was very, he was a very, very difficult coach. He, he, he didn't take excuses very lightly. In fact, um, he didn't take them at all. Either you're going to do training his way or, or you're going to pack your bags and go home. And Marcelo, what I mean, years he was very was cutthroat. What, what years was this? This was, this was 88 okay. uh, when, we, when Mark and I went to training camp. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, Mark really, you know, and of course we roomed together. Um, Mark was very, uh, was the guy that I really leaned on because I was, I mean, there, after, I think after the second week of training, I was just, I mean, I was blown. I was, my legs were tired. I was tired. I couldn't get enough sleep. Um, and you know, and, and one, <laughs> I remember one day Mark getting dressed for, 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 to go on a training ride. It was supposed to be like a 40 mile training ride. Now you understand for sprinters, everything we did had to do with sprinting. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just a leisure 40 mile training ride. We were going to go out and sooner or later, someone was going to attack the group. And then we were going to go in a pace line and try to catch that person. And then someone else was going to attack. That's the way our training rides were. Um, but there was one day where I just laid in bed and Mark's like, come on, we got to go. We got to go. I'm like, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm 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 dead tired. I'm not going. So Mark goes, Oh, all right. And so Mark, you know, closes the door, he goes out, and I'm laying there and I just thought to myself, Who am I kidding? I said, Andre's gonna come through that door in about ten minutes. <laughs> so there I was, like one leg at a time getting dressed for cycling. And who comes through the door? And I mean he didn't come through the door like knocking. I mean he he, he slammed the door open, came in. And I, I looked at him and I said, oh, I'm coming. And so, uh, it was, it was, and I, I'll tell you what, I remember that ride. I was in the back the whole time. I'm just, I'm holding on for dear life. Like these guys are just going 28 miles an hour. I'm just dying. Yeah. But so much, so, you know, it's the recovery. Yeah. It sounds like the recovery was difficult, but also just, you know, the, the, the mental part of it, the psychology of, um, of that grind. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, mentally you had to be a hundred percent, right? You really did. Um, it, it was, you know, aside from the training and Mark, you know, alluded to a lot of our training was on the road, uh, -huh. uh in the winter months, you know, but what he didn't tell you is we were riding 300 mile days. Oh, I mean, 300 week, mile weeks. Week. Oh. Yeah. yeah. 300 mile weeks. Um, on top of that, we had the gym three days a week yeah. and then we had these things called turbo trainers that we had to do. So all that accumulated, we, you know, and then, uh, and then writing 300 mile weeks, um, it helped you keep your bo body fat down. But it, what it also did is it set up a base because for, for what Andre believed is we need to set that base because what's to come on the track, um, was even uh, was probably just as hard. And, and, you know, Mark will tell you, we, we had, I think we were on the track no less than four or five hours 
a day when we were on the track. I mean, it was, it was it's grueling. It was one, one exercise after another. Wow. Yeah. So, so it was, it was a, it's a, it's a grueling event and it, it really is. So Mark, I know, you know if the eighties, as the eighties are coming to a close, Mark, you're, you're making some career choices there. So was that the end of competitive cycling for you in 91 or, or 90 when you started with the, with the highway patrol or, or what happened? Did you balance both of them for a little while? Yeah. Ironically, Bill, you know, it was going to the highway patrol ended up being a rebirth for my cycling career. Um, and I, I never foresaw that happening. So 1988, again, with that crash and missing world championships, it was devastating, uh, for me. In the meantime, I, I watched Marcelo, you know, continue with career. By the way, I kept racing all the way through 1990 because I went, I started the academy in 1990. So I was able to race through 1990 and just moderate success. I was a, you know, I was a, you know, a middle range national team member. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, and I think in 1988, Marcelo, you can correct me. I think in 1989, there was no national team. They just, they just disbanded for a year. There was nothing. So nobody was in the national team in 1989, if I can remember yeah. correctly. But, um, so 1990, and, uh, uh, I think I got fifth, I think it, it, in an event in, in, um, in Pennsylvania, I think it was, um, national championships. And that was kind of the end of it because now 1991, 1990, 1991 in the academy, I got out of the academy. Um, I started my career, like you said with the Ohio patrol and by about 1994 now here I am I'm at this point I'm 30 31 years old I'm long in the tooth for any cyclist at this point and but I have this it reminded me when Marcelo was talking about his you know just I'm just trying to get through high school so I can so I can you know train and race full time I got this burning desire to go back and I still I don't, don't know really what the drive was, but I, I think there was just something inside that said, you have more to offer. Mm -hmm. There's more in there. And maybe at 30, 31 years old, you, you're actually, maybe you're a late bloomer. Maybe you're approaching your physical peak. And again, I'm just kind of like talking out of my rear end to myself. But, um, and again, I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. I lived in a crappy little apartment in Arcadia, California. And Marcel has been there uh, many times and laughing at me about it. And, but so I, I had the freedom, at least there were, I didn't have any obligations other than to the higher patrol. So for that, from that point, I was, I was able to do whatever I wanted. And so I thought that, you know what, Mark, you have to do something different. In other words, you were a part of the U S national team for some years. You did the training, they, the way they did it and things like this, you looked away to where they did it. So I thought you'd come back. If you want something different, mm. you damn well better do something different than you did before. So I started thinking about this. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to go unorthodox here. So what I did in 1994, I hired a bodybuilding weight trainer. His name was David Williams. And he was a nationally ranked uh, bodybuilder back in the early 19, uh, mid 1980s, I believe. And I hired him. He was, he was a friend of a friend. He and I became very, very good friends. So I hired him. I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go blast myself in the gym. I'm going to do more gym work than maybe I'll do on the bicycle. I'm going to just try something asymmetric here. I'm going to just, bam, that's what I did. And then I actually hired a, a mutual friend, and he was an assistant coach on the um, uh, national team. Um, and he lived in Pennsylvania. And I paid him for monthly training programs on the turbo trainer. That Marcelo talked about when we had in, in, in camp. And what is that, Mark, real quick? So turbo trainers, just a matter of fact, I used it this morning down, down, down in the garage, but it's just simply it's a it's a machine that you could you put your your road bike into and you you can you can adjust the resistance and and the more advanced ones, there were different ones. We used one was called a Cat Eye 1000. I'll never forget. It's like freaking having a tattoo in your head. It was so painful. Um <laughs> But it, it, it uh, you could adjust the resistance. It shows you how much wattage you're putting out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, has your timing. Again, this is again, this is 30 years ago. So there's no internet stuff. There's none of that stuff. It's just all right there on your screen. And so you, it's a really, really good way to uh, judge 
how much effort, truly how much effort you're putting out because it shows how much energy you're making with your wattage. So that you can't lie to yourself. The machine won't lie to you. So I have these very strict turbo trainer workouts and these are very, very hard, very hard intervals. I mean, you know, 90% maximum output for, for, you know, 30 seconds and then a short recovery and do it again and short recovery and do it again. And all you imagine yourself, oh, I've died and gone to hell. Right. This is what hell's like. I, I know what it can't be any worse than this. <laughs> That's what it felt like. But these are the things that um, I focused on. And ironically, being separated from the national team, I knew up here that I was forced. I was absolutely forced not to allow myself to ever cheat the training. I didn't have the opportunity because like Marcelo said, now I wasn't surrounded by Marcelo Ruse and Marty Nofsteins and Ken Carpenters and Nelson Bells. I wasn't immersed in that group. It was me in my apartment and my couple of road rides a week in the velodrome a couple of days a week. All I had it was Mark Garrett by myself. And so with all, and again, I was getting up, I was going to work. You know, I was working at a swing shift. I come home and get home about 11 o'clock at night. I'd be asleep at midnight. I'd be up at seven o'clock exactly every morning. I'd be off for a 50 mile road ride. I'd be going to the gym. I'd be going to the turbo trainer. I'd be driving down to Carson, down to the doldrum. And that was six or sometimes seven days a week I trained. And with all that said, it paid off. And unlike by time the 1980s, in the mid-1990s, from 1996 through 1998, those three seasons, I won four elite national championships. Wow. And at 35 years old, I won my last elite national championship, um, kind of way above the age that most people expect to, to be that competitive. Um, so it worked out, and then I quit. And uh, I actually came back one year about, I don't know, about four or five years later. And did okay, and uh, but that was it. And so that that's kind of my weird story in a nutshell there. Yeah. So Marcelo, as you you know, you talked about the grueling training. Yeah. Contrast that, or 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 compare that to what you experienced when you made the Olympic team. And I guess my first question is, I don't know. Generally, the Olympic trials are a few months before the games. Do I have that right? Yes. Yeah, it's about uh, it's about two two months before the game. So, so what was the what was the training like as a member or leading up to that for you? Like, what was the training like to the Olympic trials and then as a member of the Olympic team? Well, you know, let me start by saying this because Mark really um, he really downplays what he did. Uh, you have to understand that Mark was he was a full time CHP officer, right? And he didn't race in the master event. He raced in the senior event. That's all the guys that were going to the world championships that were preparing for the Olympics. And the year that he was training full-time and, and, and working full-time, he ended up second at the national championships. That is an incredible, incredible achievement. Mm. Because every guy that he beat, including me, all we did was train full time. Right. And and Mark really underplays this because I I've told him for years. I said, "What you did, there's no way I can do that. There's no way." Um, Mark is the most disciplined guy. When he puts his mind to something, he is the most disciplined guy I've ever met in my entire life. Um, the amount of planning that he had to do uh, to get to go to the national championship. Yep. At the elite level, being a full-time CHP officer, uh, it's just it's mind-boggling because uh, it's just not something that I uh, that I I think I could you know must stir up. Uh, so that being said, the training was just as grueling. I mean, uh, we 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 continue to train very hard. Um, you know, it's it, for me it was the same uh, the same attitude I approached that I had for years, and that was. The winter months is where I put in a lot of my work, a lot of the foundation. Um, and I was, again, in the gym three days a week for about two, two and a half hours every day. Um, or the, the, uh, like Monday, Wednesday, Fridays was our gym day. And then um, either I was doing a turbo trainer after that, 
and then a 30 mile ride. So you're training on two to three times a day. So I didn't have, you know, that was my life. I didn't have time to, for anything else. Um, you know, at that time and leading into the Olympics and, you know, um, I was already married, um, to Lisa. And so we, you know, she was, she really accommodated my lifestyle because there was, it was still early, to, early to rise and early to bed. Right. There was no late nights for me. Um, so, you know, it, it was, it was something that, you know, it was an accomplishment for me because that, that was the ultimate goal was to go to the Olympics and, 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 um, give it my all with my natural ability. Um, and it's something that I always believed in that, if I was going to accomplish anything in cycling, it was going to be my natural ability. I wasn't going to push the envelope, as they say. Right. Um, I think the most that I took uh, back then was creatine. Right. And, and I thought creatine helped me a lot, but um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would never cross that line. Uh, even though Mark will tell you that we were encouraged to. Yeah. Um, it's not something that I ever uh, dreamed of doing. Uh, and we never did. We we just didn't. I mean, that, so, that's interesting because. But, oh no, go ahead, Marcelo. No, I was just going to say that you know I, I think that uh, performance enhancing drugs do give you an advantage on recovery, yeah. uh, where you can train very hard one day and then the next day it's, your legs are or your muscles are recovered to the point where you can do it again. Uh -huh. um, but I think there's a misconception of. Of because you took performing enhancing drugs that you can basically sit on a couch and all of a sudden you're just going to be that much faster, that much stronger. And that, that's not, that's absolutely not true. Right. Um, you have to still put in the effort, but again, it was not something that, that Mark and I would ever cross. We just wouldn't do it. Yeah. That's uh that's interesting. Cause I know in, I guess what this time period, the, the, on, in road racing, um, was Greg Lamont was in the forefront, right? Um, Miguel Indurain? Yeah. Was he, was he a Spaniard yes. or a... Yeah. Right? Spaniard. Yeah, Spaniard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these guys that won multiple tours, I think three and maybe four or five for, for Miguel. When I look at the record books today, and I want to know how you guys feel about this, because to some extent... Uh, well, let, let me ask you guys first. I look at the record books today, and I see 1999 through, I don't know, whatever it was, 2005, 2006, Tour de France, no winner. Right. How do you feel about that when you see no winner? And 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 we're talking. So you want to tackle it or what, what's that? Or me? Uh, well, What's that? I have my own. I have my own view on the on something like this, just because, um, you know, when you know the insides of cycling, uh -huh. uh, not as a spectator but as a competitor, and you know, um, what the ground rules are especially in the tour. Now you have to understand the tour is a multi-million dollar event. Right. Sponsors are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars and cyclists uh, are making that hundreds of thousands. Um, well, thou you know, uh, I know Lamon, I mean, Lamon uh, Armstrong, I think he would take his prize money. He made so much money in sponsorship mm -hmm. that he would take his prize money and, and split it between the team. He wouldn't take any of the prize money when it came to the tour, mm -hmm. but there was, there was an understanding that and in my view, the top 10 guys were on what they called EPO, mm -hmm. which, which stands for ethro protein, mm -hmm. which is basically, uh, an injection to where it basically creates red blood cells, which gives more oxygen exactly. to your muscles. Right. Um, Right. But that was an evolution too. You know, what people don't understand is the history of it, the how we got the EPO. You know, it all started with uh, high altitude training. Mm -hmm. You know, when cyclists would figure out that their red blood cells would develop in in altitude, and then they would come down to sea level and, and race. Mm -hmm. Now that would work for let's say a world championship, which was a, a one day event. But when it came to the tour, the tour was three weeks they realized that after a week, your red blood cells became normal like everyone else. So that didn't work for the tour. And then from there, it went on to blood doping, mm -hmm. which lasted a little longer. 
but it wasn't very convenient, which led into EPO, which was a lot more convenient. Um, so to me, it's, you know, look, if you took 10 cyclists and you put them all on EPO, for instance, yeah. you're still going to have one winner. Yep. And you have to ask yourself why. Why is it that that guy beat the other 10 or the other nine guys if they're all on EPO? And it does come down to talent. Yeah. It comes down to raw talent. Now, Lance, um, my view is, and I know I'm going to get probably backlash for this, but my view is, is that he was leveling the playing field. He knew who was on EPO and he knew that he couldn't beat them without it. So he said, I'm going to do the same thing and let's see who the best guy is. And he yeah. did, you know, he won seven tours. Um, so to me, it's like, in my opinion, he leveled the playing field and said, well, let's, let's see who the best guy is now. Right. Um, you know, so, but is it, is it, is it cheating? Sure. But if you're, if the top 10 guys are doing it, then, you know, are we, are we leveling the playing field or are we cheating? Right. Because eventually the guy with the most talent, in my opinion, still won. Right. Um, but I don't know, whatever. I don't know what Mark thinks. About it. What, what do you think, Mark? And then I'll share what, what I think about it. Well, my views are are, are similar to Marcello's. Um, you know, I, I've been a sports fan all my life. And, and one of the sports I love to watch, not lately because my driver can't seem to finish in the same lap as the rest of the drivers, but uh, <laughs> it's NASCAR. And I, I've been a NASCAR fan since I was, you know, 10 years old. My first race I went to when I was 19, uh, 1974 in Riverside. I bring that up because my favorite driver of all time is Richard Petty. Yeah. He won 200 races. I think the next guy in line, number two, uh, is it Pearson or Yarbrough? I think mean, Pearson's like, won like 110 or something, yeah. 105 races. My guess is, I don't have any proof, but my guess is Richard Petty won a lot of those races by uh, fudging the rules. Mm -hmm. We'll put it that 100%. way. I'm talking about engines and things like this. And they used to blow engines up on purpose called double clutching uh, at the end of the race or, or, or downshifting from fourth gear down to second gear. As soon as they cross the finish line, they blow their engines up. So there wouldn't be anything for the officials to inspect after the race, the NASCAR officials. They would literally blow their engines up on purpose. So I suspect that the greatest driver of all time in the eyes of almost anybody, any NASCAR fan, Richard Petty, probably cheated. Um, but just like Marcelo said, so was everybody else. Yeah. In other words, everybody was cheating against the rule book, but as far as each other, they were all doing the same thing. So in that sense, it wasn't even playing field. Also to what Marcelo said, the guy that is going to finish two laps down, you could put a jet engine in his car and he probably still wouldn't have won because he just wasn't that talented driver. Richard Petty was one of the most talented people ever to be behind the wheel of a race car, period, regardless what he did outside the rules or, or possibly did outside the rules. Mm -hmm. It's analogous to, to Lance Armstrong. People have to understand there are a couple of things here. Lance Armstrong, with whatever he did chemical-wise, substance-wise, when, when he was winning those, those, those tours, Lance Armstrong had just survived brain and testicular cancer. He was literally on his deathbed. He was not expected to live. They removed one testicle. He had all kinds of radiation, chemotherapy, things like this. Cancer of the brain all throughout his body. And he survived that. Not only did he survive that, he was going out and training in between chemo sessions. Where, you know, most people were vomiting, going bald. By the way, he was too. And in between sessions, he was going out and he was training on his bicycle. When most people didn't think that he would live much longer. He came out of that, and within a couple of years, he won his first Tour de France. And I suspect that then, uh, you know, he was, he was sanctioned for it, that he had to use substances that were banned. But I'm thinking, gee, what other fella in the Tour de France won it or finished in the top 10 or won King of the Mountain or won time trial? who had just survived what most people consider deadly, a death sentence cancer diagnosis. Who? Nobody. Nobody. Lance Armstrong 
drugs or no drugs, I still think is one of the greatest cyclists of all time. His reputation is forever and rightly tainted because of what he did. What got Lance Armstrong, what, what ended up costing Lance Armstrong those titles was not his drug use that he's admitted to. It was not his drug use. It was his mouth. Lance Armstrong, along with being one of the most talented athletes to ever live, specifically cycling, is also one of the most arrogant people who's ever lived. Maybe, maybe his arrogance has been toned down now uh, some. But Lance Armstrong was attacking people that were accusing, of, accusing him of engaging his behavior. And rather than just keeping his mouth shut and saying, whatever, I'm just doing my job, whatever, whatever, right. and keep racing. He went on the offensive and he accused people of the worst things and called people the worst names. And some of those people, Marcelo and I know, mm -hmm. even wives of cyclists, he said the most horrible things about. He also pissed off the sanctioning bodies with his arrogance. Mm -hmm. The point is he brought as much attention to himself as anybody could have. And that's what resulted in them digging, 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 and coming up with new testing procedures and all these things that eventually unveiled the fact that he was using his drugs, drugs, cost him those titles, and cost him his reputation. Did you guys read the book L.A. Confidential back in uh, 04 or, or what, whenever that came out about doping and cycling or, at all? I never did. Okay. No. no. Yeah. I never did. Yeah, I, I feel, so my opinion is, is the same as Marcelo's. I feel like, I, I, I mean, he won the Tour de France in my eyes. He competed. The playing field for the top athletes was even, and that's just my opinion. And uh, and he yeah. won, and his name, in my opinion, should really be there. And I get it; uh, there were rules violations, but you know, were, and and that's you know, I, I guess that's why the number two they don't just make the number two person that year the winner because who knows, you know, who who knows what was going on. Um, yeah. You know, and then today I yeah. see it, you know, from my time at DEA and, and I do work now with the California Athletic Commission and I'm familiar with drug testing, doping and, and the stuff you're talking about. It's just so much more advanced today. Um, hey, this is, you know, we're talking about 20 years ago. It's, you know, doping in sports still goes on today. Uh, you, you see the, the, the show, uh, was it Icarus? About the the Russian team, the state sanctioned blood doping of the of the Russian team. I didn't. I I you know, know the story. You and I will I have to talk about that sometime, Mark. Maybe yeah. leading up to the summer games this year. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess to wrap it up, guys. You know, do you do you both still have a love of cycling, and do you cycle now recreationally? And are you involved in any kind of coaching or mentoring cyclists or or? Or where are you at with the sport? I mean, will you be watching the, the Olympic Games this summer and, and watching the velodrome? You know what? I'm going to let Marcelo finish it up. So I'll go first so Marcelo can have the last word in the show. Um, yeah, I'll be watching. The truth is there's two things here. One, um, I was much better at racing bicycles in a velodrome than I ever was at playing football. But football is still my passion as far as watching Sport. I love it and 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 auto racing, but I'll be watching um, the cycling, and I want everybody to watch the Olympics and enjoy it. And if you never raced a bicycle, never took part in the competition, you probably won't know the difference. But from my point of view, and I'll see what Marcelo says, <laughs> the match sprinting, and other other uh, events on the Veldrum are not what they used to be, as far as I'm concerned. It's not as exciting as it used to be. I see Marcel nodding his head. Yeah. Um, and why I is still that? Enjoy it. Explain I, to people why you say that, Mark. Why do you say that? Well, you know what? I know Marcel and I agreement, so I saw okay. him shaking his head. So I'll let him explain okay. that. But I'll be watching mm -hmm. and um, and got to enjoy it. Uh, these guys that are, and gals that are on there now, they're doing exactly what you know the rules tell them they can do and they have to do. So they're 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 excelling within the parameters that they exist in. But they're different than parameters that Marcel and I existed and raced in, you know, 30 and 40 years ago. So, um, but with that said, I will turn yeah. it back over to Mr. Rue and he could talk about maybe why we're not as excited about watching as we used to be. Well, you know, I'll tell you, you know, before when Mark and I were racing, it wasn't always the fastest or the strongest guy was gonna win because there was tactics involved. You don't have that anymore in, in the sprinting events. Um, 
if I knew that Mark was faster than me uh, from the front, let's say, then I would tactically try to get in front of him and pin him to the wall, mm -hmm. which is the top side of the velodrome. And then I would leave him there and, and make him try to get out of it because I knew that if I let him out, he was going to beat me. So tactically, I would pin him to a wall or keep him high on the track. Um, that would be my tactic. Now, it would be up to him to try to figure how he was going to get by me. You don't really have that anymore in, in, in the sprinting events. Now it's all about power. I mean, they ride these humongous gears, um, just huge gears. I mean, I think for us, a 94-inch gear, which was, a, I believe, a 9414, 94 being the front uh, chain ring, yeah. and uh, 14 uh, being back cock. Oh, I'm sorry, 49, right? 49. What did I say? 49 well, anyway, in the front, 14 yeah. in the back. Got it. Yeah, so that was a big gear for us. Now they're riding 130, 140, 150 inch gears, which is, it's ridiculous. It's like a 55 in the front and a 13 cog in the back. Ooh. I mean, it's just, all it is, is just power. Power uh, uh, and strength. You don't have the time to, so to be Marcella, to were, tactically. Were there rule changes to to prevent some of the strategies that you're talking about? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't once. So there's lines on the track. Once you enter the red line, is the bottom of the track. Once you enter the red line in in a full sprint, you can't come out of it. Back in the day, you could. Back in the day, that you can come out of the red line, um, to a to a certain degree, but now you can't. Once you hit that red line, you're you're basically uh, committed to the sprint. Uh, so I I mean it's not as exciting it as it was when Mark and I was racing. Um, there was a lot more tactics. There was a lot more planning involved when you were coming up against a competitor. And again, my my pops was so good at looking at someone. And then relaying to me how we're going to beat that person. Right. Um, you know, and so there was a lot more strategy involved, uh, which made the, the event uh, so much more exciting in my, in my opinion. Right. Um, and you don't, you, you really, you really don't have that now watching it. Yeah. I'll watch it. I mean, I like to see who's, you know, who's winning. I, I like to look at the bikes they're riding now. Um, yeah. Will I be excited about it? I don't think I, I not as excited as I was watching, you know, 84, 88 Olympics, 92 Olympics. Um, it's, it doesn't have the same feel to me. Right. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I'll support it because I think, you know, the Olympics is a great thing. It's a great accomplishment for these athletes from all the sports. I mean, it's, it's, uh, the pinnacle of someone's career to, to especially to represent your country in such a, such a huge event. So the, one of the most exciting tours that I saw was, uh, was Lance and, uh, Orich, uh, and Orich was a, a German writer. And I think they were, they, they had like a minute and a half gap and, uh, Lance was up by about a minute and a half and they were starting the, the hill climb and somehow Orich misses the turn and, and falls just over the little edge. And to my surprise, Lance looks back and sees him fall and Lance turns around and waits for him to get back on his bike where Lance could have just taken off. And I mean, there was no way Urwich was going to catch him. After the race, they asked Lance, well, why did you do that? I mean, that was like a gift for you. And he said, that's not the way I, I want to win. Yeah. When people see me win this tour, they're going to know that I beat the best guy. And right now, Urwich is the best guy next to me and so he waited for him and i thought to myself yeah. hey. there's no way this guy can lose i mean that is such what kind of confidence yeah. do you have that the, the second guy that is uh, the guy that can take your your crown away you're waiting for him to get back on his bike so, i mean so mark let, let me let me I ask think, you a question so so how much difference can the doping or will the doping make how much difference does doping make in in this level of competition even if it's only 
Because the one thing we haven't discussed is, does it give you a mental edge where you feel like you feel like you're stronger because you know what you're doing, or, or is that not even a factor at this level where it's just the the the, the top three are going to be the top three regardless? You know, as far as the, the psychological edge, you know, I can't speak to that. Mm -hmm. I've never I've never used any uh, illegal, you know, in, in enhancement. Uh, drugs or any illegal drugs, you know, t at, at all in my life. So I can't speak to what confidence uh, booster it might be. It very well may be. We, you know, talk about placebos in, in medicine all the time. If people feel better, even though they got shot with water, you know, who knows? Right. It's certainly possible, maybe likely. But I'll tell you this about about Lance Armstrong is that, you know, and, and I've only met the guy a couple of times, you know, uh, cross paths here and there. Um, so I don't know him any better than anybody else does, but just observing him from afar, so to speak, and, and, and seeing what he over overcame with the cancer and things like this, I just can't imagine anybody being more disciplined, more disciplined, more driven than Lance Armstrong. In other words, he did, as far as I've read, as far as I've watched, and as far as I've heard from people who do know him intimately, and I do know people very well who know him very intimately, that there probably never was a cyclist, and we'll keep it narrow for purpose of, of, of this discussion, there never was a more disciplined cyclist when it came to training. There was never a more focused, more driven cyclist than, than Lance Armstrong. So what difference does, does doping make, depending on what it is? I think when you are talking about other people who were clearly doping as well, it is extremely minimal when it comes to this. These are people, all of them, all of the, these people in the Tour de France, whether they're, whether they're using uh, drugs or not, these are the elite of the elite. These are people who can go out in their tennis shoes in coveralls and it might be, best day, my best day on a road bike can out climb me up Antrus Crest Highway with one hand on a handlebar without thinking about it just because they're so nat naturally gifted. So when you think about 80 or 100 guys like this in the margin, the margin of, of ability from the top finisher to the, to the last person who actually finished the Tour de France, you know, the overall time is not that great when you think about 2,100 miles over three weeks. We're talking about minutes here. We're talking about minutes. So does injecting some substance into your arm or whatever it is, the way that you ingest or absorb these types of things or inject them, does it make an average world-class cyclist now the top world-class cyclist? No, not even close. Does it give a 1% edge to the elite of the elite, the top four or five or 10 guys in the world? Maybe. But we're talking about such thin, thin margins, in my opinion here. Um, you know, I still think that Lance Armstrong was one of the greatest cyclists, is one of the greatest cyclists that ever lived. And, and fi finally, what about pressures? I mean, I mean you, you kind of alluded to it maybe when we, when we started talking about doping. Um, were there pressures or discussions to use drugs at the, as a competitor? Well, you know, Marcelo talked about that earlier and, and, you know, I think a lot of pressure, it's just like Marcelo being driven. Hey, I can't wait to get out of high school to, so I can train, I can whatever. That's self-imposed pressure for me. Hey, I want to, I, I want to start a comeback in 1994. I want to, I want to make sure I exhaust every, every physical asset that I have in, in, in achieving the highest level of success in cycling. Most pressure is self-imposed. Most pressure is self-imposed. And I think that's really true when it comes to elite athletes. Otherwise, they wouldn't be elite athletes. Elite anybody, by the way. Elite anybody. Uh -huh. Most pressure is self-imposed. People, you know, it was, uh, um, uh, I think it was a, a, a Jimmy Johnson, the former coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. Yes, I'm a Cowboys fan. But they asked him years ago, hey, how do you motivate? How do you motivate people? How do you motivate these people? How do you motivate? How do you motivate? And he goes, it's easy. Find people who are self-motivated. <laughs> right. His job was to identify people who wanted to do what had to be done to achieve the success, not for him to artificially somehow jack these people up and make them do things they didn't want to do. It's the same thing in this case with cycling that, and, and with drug use. Your motivation 
is is you, your self motivation and your 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 self imposed pressure is when a coach may walk over to you or a manager seems like hey you know what you may want to start taking some of these vitamins because other guys are taking the vitamins. Marcelo and I just said our motivation was to be the best we could be within the abilities that God gave us and with what we could do with our own self-discipline. It wasn't to interject, not inject, but it wasn't to interject any foreign substance into the equation. We wanted to be as good as we could be with our natural talents and our natural drive. That was just us. That was our, that was our wall. That was our limit. Right. We, we, it wasn't, it just, it still wasn't. We, we never had that, um, that desire to go faster to the point that we would do something that we thought was unethical. And it's one of the reasons that, that Marcel and I are each other's best friends in the world, because we think so much alike when it comes to like, it's not even a question. Right. You, what do you mean? I'm not going to get the gold. I'm going to get the bronze. Okay. I get the bronze, right. but I'm going to do it ethically. Yeah, right. you know, I don't know. I'm going to speak for some of these athletes. I guess in a case of a top athlete, when there is a $5 million bonus, like I think Lance, after winning his sixth or something consecutive tour, he was paid out a $5 million bonus. When there's that, when there's that incentive and you're looking at what you think or what you know everyone else in the field is doing and you're saying, man, I'm going to be at a disadvantage to them or a perceived disadvantage and, and, you know, and I'm passing on a $5 million bonus because I'm not doing what these other guys are doing. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's added pressure to that. And I think when it comes to sponsorship, they expect a certain amount of success which any sponsor would um you know uh, like i said when when you're on the inside of the sport looking out um you understand i think a little more of the the psyche of 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 someone like lance that had responsibilities to his sponsors and I, i'm not justifying that because like i said uh mark and i think a lot alike where we're it, it was just not, it was not a, a line that we were, we wanted to cross or we were going to cross. And, and I think that, but is it uh, added pressure uh, in, at that level? Sure. I mean, I mean, look at all the, the track and field uh, athletes that were caught for, for performance enhancing drugs, you know, it, you know, and it, and it's, it's minimal. I mean, it is minimal. Um, but at the same time, um, it's hard to explain to somebody a, a $5 million payout, uh, you know, as opposed to getting zero for this bonus, if you don't win this, this event, um, unless you're an athlete yourself and you understand the, the sacrifices that you've made and the, the time that you've put into training. Cause, um, you know, I can't imagine what. Lance's training was like, I, I, I don't know, I'm assuming it was very, it was grueling for him. Um, but again, is there pressures when it comes to that kind of money? I, I would, I would have to say yes. Um, but you know, yeah, I, I think everyone checks themselves uh, uh, to be honest. I think there's every person. And I think Mark and I have, you know, uh, without, mentioning any names we were both approached mm -hmm. to enhance our our abilities through uh, you know drug use and uh, and i think we just it was just a, such a hard it was such an easy decision for both of us to go no that's not something that we're we're going to do that's not the line we're going to cross and like mark said hey if it if if I get the bronze, well, then so be it. I get the bronze. Was there testing, guys, at the levels? Oh yeah. What's that? Oh yeah. yeah. There was. There was. <laughs> Mark laughs. laughs. Um, yeah, there was. I mean, it, it, so the. I, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. If you were on the, if you were in the top three at nationals, you know, gold, silver, and bronze, you were going to get tested. I think it was. It was. I, I'm almost positive Marcel was top two. Oh, top two. Okay. I think it, it was top you're probably right. Yeah, I think it was top two. You autom so it, 
at national championships, top two were automatically tested. And then they, I can't remember how many, how many, but then there were random tests. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind oh, of right. You're right. They picked. Uh... So when when uh, just to piggyback on Mark, when when you won uh, gold or silver, there was someone attached to you right yep. away. You had to sign a piece of paper, yep. and if you went to go put your tennis shoes on, that person was attached yep. to you. Which is a funny story. I was at the World Cup in Italy, and I ended up getting third in the Karen. Nobody came up to me or anything. So, you know, I, I got my medal, I put my shoes on, took my bike and my bag, and I went back to the hotel. Here I am showering, um, and someone pounds on my door. Bah, 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 I'm going, what the hell? And so I opened the door, and it's a person from the UCI going, you're supposed to be drug tested. You, 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 got, you got third. I go, well, how am I supposed to know? I, no, one, no one said anything to me. So, of course, I had gone to the bathroom already. Right. So there I was in now in a room at the track for hours because I couldn't go to the bathroom. And so, you know, it was one of those things where, and I, I, I'll tell you right now, I can see in their face that they were very suspicious of me. Mm -hmm. But I, I just told them the truth. I go, well, isn't some, aren't I supposed to sign a piece of paper and someone's supposed to be attached to me? And they go, yeah, well, we couldn't find you. I said, was on, I was on the podium. I was on the podium, exactly. <laughs> I'm the guy with the, that had the medal around his neck on the podium. Yeah. It's yeah, Marcel and I peed more bottles yeah. over the year than a homeless guy on, on Los Angeles Street in downtown LA. Um, <laughs> it, it, you know, over the years, and it just got, you know, again, I'm, I'm glad the testing was there, yeah. but to, it's, it's kind of a tedious process, yeah. and not only at, at events, but of course, it, when we were in, 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 um, training camp when the national team we would have um officials show up quote unquote randomly uh -huh. and um and right there we you know you, you couldn't leave your your room and then they had to follow you over all to a a a, a, um, a general room where all the team was brought together and then while you were there you, you have to go in and, and, and pee and that happened a number of times. Just like, the reason I say randomly to show up, it just seemed like sometimes a team member or two would disappear the night before the testing. Um, yeah. And that happened <laughs> more than yeah. once. Uh, someone's relative passed away. Hey, and that is the most. And... There was, yeah. I mean, I know of an athlete whose mother almost passed away about three times. And, and he and this is I'm dead serious. And it's, each time he had to unexpectedly leave the country immediately, and uh, eventually he did test positive and and catch a ban. But yeah, that's uh, that's definitely you know you're, you're right about that part. Well, guys, thank you, uh, Marcelo Aru. Thank you for representing the United States in uh, one of the purest competitions there is, the Olympic Games. Um, Man, that's got to be a, a proud Thanks, moment Bill. for you and, and all respect for, for being basically the best in the, one of the best in the world at, at, your, at your sport. Mark, it was great to Thanks, hear Bill. the stories about you. Most people don't know them, uh, how you were able to. And that's one thing that I questioned is how do you compete at that level with a demanding full-time job? I think, as Marcelo pointed out, credit to you for, for being one of the very, very few people who could uh, – pull that out, pull that off and, and do it. Um, thank you guys. Thank you for the discussion about cycling. And, uh, and Hey, based on this, I will be watching the Olympics a little closer and, uh, and looking at cycling. Great conversation. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Bill. Bill.